the Marina Skewer podcast. My name's Marina, I'm a yarn dyer and spinner uh, and a knitting designer and tech editor. In this podcast I talk about yarny, crafty things, um, mostly about knitting and some seasonal making. Today I've got a bit of a long episode for you. It's uh, I've got a couple of fairly slow relaxing segments, one on spinning and, well, how I prepare raw fleece for spinning a rustic textured yarn, and comparing a couple of methods of preparing lichen for dye. And I hope you're going to enjoy those. First up, I'm going to show you the things that I'm knitting and have knitted. So first is this one, which I talked about in the last episode and I wasn't sure if I was going to get it ready for Edinburgh. I managed to finish it while I was in Edinburgh, very late at night in the hotel room. Um, I can show you, I can't quite fit it all in, um, but it's got nice little details on the cuffs here and the same around the hem. Um, I absolutely love it. It's, I've been wearing it pretty much non-stop since I finished it. Um, it's, it's really cosy. It, the design is called Cronblad by Verena Coors, who is Sustainablist on Instagram and Ravelry. And the yarn is my Mendip 4-ply, so the main colour is the Stormy base, which is a naturally coloured base. And then the contrast colour is the same colour dyed on a white base. Um, so I have those available in the shop. And for other finished things, I showed off this one last time, so I'll do this one quite quickly. I've got the Hairless Hat, which is in a DK weight yarn. It's one that I've designed, and the pattern is now live on Ravelry. Um, so it's very pretty. Well, I think so. I really like it. I like these diagonal lines. They kind of look like a crown. Um, I was wearing it the other day and I just kind of bunged it on my head so I think all of my hair was hiding and I got on the bus and the bus driver said have you got any hair under there? and I was like I've got some but what is that relevant to anything? Um, so yes having long hair is something that I do really miss for wearing with hats because I think it looks nicer it looks strange to me I try and keep my fringe sticking up but I much prefer for me um, having long hair when I wear it with hats but that is personal preference. Um, another thing I have finished is something that I made while I was in Edinburgh. I literally bought the yarn from Garthenor. I saw this yarn, um, they didn't have it on their stand and I asked if they had any heavier weight yarns because um, I knew that they had some, but I didn't know if they'd stop doing them, but they just didn't have space for them. And so they brought out this super chunky yarn for me to have a look at, and I had to buy it immediately because it's gorgeous. So it's a Ryland, um, and it's white plied with a brown, so you get this beautiful marl effect. And this knitted up, honestly, in a few hours. Like, I, I want to say less than three like and that's including unraveling and having to do weird things about counting how much yarn I used because I want to make sure that um, when I have the pattern published people will be able to use up as much as possible of the yarn that they have um, and so I'm really really keen on it like it does stand up on its own but usually I wear it kind of a bit folded like that and then tucked into my coat um, and I just really, well, I love, I love me some geometric lines. Um, so we've got a bit of seed stitch and a bit of ribbing. Um, and I am looking for test knitters for this one at the moment. So if you want a very speedy project, um, I'm going to have the pattern available at Wonderwall at the end of the month where I'm exhibiting. And so I would like to have the pattern tested by then um, which is quite a short deadline but also it's a very very speedy one for the test you can either use the yarn from Garth Noor, which is their number six and they're offering 25% off uh, the yarn for test knitters 
um, or you can use anything that you have in your stash. I also think it would be really nice for some quite bulky hand spun. Um, maybe some more RT yarn, I think it could be quite cool. Um, so yes, if you are interested in that, head over to my website. I've, I'll put a test knits link in the description box below and you can just click through and then send me an email and I'll send over the pattern. Um, and then what I'm working on at the moment is, oh, I've left it halfway through a row. That's rubbish of me. And I've got this all tangled up, what an idiot. Okay. Ooh. Right. Here we go. <laughs> oh, I've made a mess. This is dreadful. Okay, I should not have left this halfway through a row. This is a shawl I am making using yarn by the Fibre Company. Um, so it's a big old triangle shawl. If I hold it this way. Yeah, you can see what it's going to look like. Um, so it's just got like a little border with some eyelets there and it's got this nice texture where the two colours combine. Um, it's a very simple knit, uh, it's nice and meditative and the yarn is just so yummy, it's all, it's, it's got some amazing drape to it. So the yarn is Luma, um, which is merino and silk and flax. Is that everything? No, it has some cotton in it too. Um, and it's a really lovely one. So I'm going to have this pattern out ready for the summer because I think it'll be a really nice summer layering piece. Um, the colors I'm using are Blue Dusk, which is the darker sort of tealy color and Golden Mosa, which is the pale sort of buttery yellow. Um, so, I'm really enjoying that one. I started weaving in my ends lower down, but then I stopped. Um, so I will weave those in. I'm trying to do it as I go because no one likes reaching the end of something and then having to weave in all the ends, even if it's not that many. Um, and the final thing I have to show you is terribly exciting. Uh, this has literally just arrived today and I've been waiting and waiting for the FedEx man, hoping that it was going to show up. And it is this. This is my very first custom yarn from the mill. It's a DK weight. It's a three, three fold DK weight. It's a grey, which is a natural blend of white and coloured lamb's wool. So it's really, really soft. The wool is from Fernhill Farm, uh, which is where my Mendip wool is from, so this is going to be Mendip DK. Um, and it's just astoundingly soft. I'm very, very pleased with it. And I'm going to be dying like a mad thing in order to get a good range of colours ready for Wonderwool. I have just over a week to get the colour range together. Um, I've already planned out all of the colours and they're going to be both rich and muted. That's a strange way to describe that. But yes, there's going to be a lot of subtlety going on, which if you know my colours is something that won't be at all a surprise. Um, so I'm very, very pleased with these. They're absolutely gorgeous and I, I hope I'm going to be able to knit up something. I might knit up one of these in this yarn um, so that people can see how it works up. Um, but yes, so I will have that available online after Wonderwool. So hopefully you'll be able to get your hands on some if you don't come to Wonderwool. If you do come to Wonderwool, come and say hi. It'll be excellent. I am very excited. It'll be my first time having a booth and yeah, I've got lots of dying to do. And without further ado, here is the rest of what I've been up to. One of the projects I've been working on over the last few weeks is a spin of a whole fleece sent to me by a customer. It's one that she bought up in Scotland when she was there, uh, directly from the crofter who raised the sheep. 
and she sent it to me um, because she wants to make a coat out of the yarn and so I have been spinning up this lovely textured tweedy yarn uh, the fleece originally had uh, sections of grey and brown and white, uh, sort of nice creamy white. Um, I believe it's a Shetland fleece but she didn't quite remember what breed it was but for me it makes sense for it to be a Shetland because of the different qualities of fibre and colours across the fleece. And so I've been making this fairly chunky yarn, uh, leaving some of the natural texture intact and hopefully this will knit up beautifully. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the process of taking it from uh, not quite the fleece because I've already done the first batch of very rough carding um, but then how I blend those fibres and on the carder and then spin them up into yarn and I hope it'll be interesting for you to see. So here I have my big bag of fleece, which I've already carded into bats. Um, so as you can see, these are quite roughly carded. So to start with, I just pick the fibre apart, just with my fingers to separate out all the, um, the clumped together sections of fleece. And then I run it through the carder once, so you can see that one side is a fair bit more uniform than the other. Um, so I, the first time round I card these into these preliminary bats and then I tear them into two um, just to put them in here and I jumble them up in the bag because that then ensures that I get a good mix so if I've been working from one part of a fleece that has quite a lot of white that will then get blended in with more grey and brown bits um, to ensure that most of the skeins, while not completely uniform, will at least not contrast each other starkly when they're used in the same project. So first thing I do when I'm going to blend these together is to just tear these apart. I tear them into smallish pieces, so about a handful's worth like that, and I do this quite roughly. And so having these all torn up like this means that I can just grab them as I'm carding. So I have them all in the little box next to me here. Oops. And do one more. those a quick turnover again just to mix them up a little bit um, it's not crucial because I did as I was carding the first round I did make a bit of an effort to ensure that I was taking a bit of each of the colours and textures of the fleece so I have my drum carder here um, I'm going to be feeding the little bits of um, pre-carded fleece into it. Now when I was carding the first time round doing the quick rough card from the picked apart fibre I was feeding through the front tray here and feeding through like this and the rotation of the smaller drum pulls the fibre through and then it draws onto the larger drum where it gets and it gets carded in this area here. Now because I've already carded this and I'm mostly just wanting to blend it um, to smooth out the fibres a bit to make it easier for spinning and to break up any remaining clumps, I'm going to be carding onto the top drum here. This will mean that, because you can probably see here, there is a directionality, so you can see a lot of the fibres are going in this direction because this is the direction they've been pulled through the drum before. Um, now if I wanted a true woolen spun yarn I would be feeding it through this way so that you would get all of the fibres crisscrossing. 
but because I want a slightly smoother, stronger yarn, I'm going to be keeping these fibres aligned and so as they get drawn onto here they will mostly be parallel. Now you won't get a true worsted spin which is where is usually from a combed preparation rather than a carded preparation and it makes for a sleeker, stronger and glossier yarn. Um, I won't get a true worsted preparation from this because you need combs to do that but it does mean that it's closer to a worsted preparation. And I'm just moving the fibre across. I am sorry about the horrible noise this thing makes. Um, I just move the fibre across to distribute it across the drum. Just letting the, the sort of tines, the needles on the carding fabric, just gently pull the fleece out of my hands. I'm keeping a bit of a grip on it, but letting it feed out. So I'm just checking here, I think I've got enough on this bat for now, so I'm going to take it off. There's a little strip here that has a groove in it and you can use that for sliding this little tool called a doffer. Mine's a bit bent because I was a bit over enthusiastic with taking off a particularly large bat at one point and you use that to lift the bat off and it means that you don't break any of the fibres because some people cut it and that's a terrible thing to do to your fibre. So now you can also, if I were um, taking these off to sell or to go for more of a woolen spun preparation I would roll the bat off like this. However, as I'm not going to be doing that, I'm just pulling it off like this. Use the doffer to get rid of any bits that may stick between the teeth here. There we go. You can see we've got fibres all moving in this direction and we've got a nice blend of the colours. So there are some areas where there's a bit more white, some are a bit more brown and grey and I will show you what I do with this next. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to get this prepared into nice little nests to spin. Um, so I pull this, I, I pre-draft it out into what I call a faux tops. Um, so tops is actually a combed preparation, as I mentioned. Um, but we're going to do this from a carded preparation. So as I said, we've got all of our 
fibres mostly parallel. There is some crisscrossing and that's lovely and fine because that means we've got a lot of texture. So what I do now is this bit requires a fair bit of control and I just, once I've rolled it up, I just pull it out like this and when you've got this much fibre it's very tempting to pull too hard and then suddenly you've got two separate pieces in your hands. So I'm just working to draw these out and separate them slightly without breaking it. If I do break it it's not the end of the world, it's easy to either rejoin or because this is going to be separated into smaller sections anyway it's not that much of a big deal. So this end here, this is the sort of thickness I'm wanting so that when I'm actually spinning I need to do very little drafting which makes the spinning go much faster and it is easier to control the fibre as I'm spinning. So now I'm going to work back along the length here and just draft out a bit more. And again I'm using both hands to just control the fibre and how much it's separating and drawing out. Any lumpy bits that are, are too thick I will just go back to on the next pass along. So you can see there I've gone a bit thin and that's quite tenuous. So I might actually, I'm going to break that there. I've still got plenty over here to draft, but I'll show you here how I then make it into the little nest. So I start gripping an end under my thumb like that, and then I wind it around my hand, just adding a little bit of tension as I go along. And this is where I'll just smooth out any lumpy or thicker bits. This is a really nice thing to do just while I'm watching a programme or listening to a podcast or something. Um, it's quite meditative work. It doesn't really require much concentration. Um, it's sort of all done by feel and it's quite automatic which makes it a lovely process and it's one of the things I really love about spinning. Um, the carding I don't enjoy so much uh, just because I find the noise of the drum carder really properly unpleasant um, but all other aspects I just find to be very soothing and they give you time to think. And so by putting the pressure, just a little bit of tension on this as I'm winding it around my hand, it means that I leave the end loose like that, and as I take it off, making an effort to not accidentally turn it inside out, I've got a nice little nest there. Um, it's nice and neat, and acts as a little ball. And so usually when I'm spinning, I'll prepare the whole... I'll prepare quite a few bats to ensure that I have enough fibre to fill up a whole bobbin. Um, of course I could sit and card the whole fleece and then draft out the whole fleece and then spin the whole fleece, um, but I prefer to alternate. Um, I prefer to alternate each task and, you know, card up, well, blend up one bat's worth the fleece and then 
Okay, so you can see there I've broken that. So I'll just rejoin by pulling apart these fibres a little bit, overlapping them. That creates a double thickness area. And then I'll just draft that out again. And that's joined perfectly. And it's very similar to the way that you join um, when spinning, if you accidentally lose an end. And as you can see, hopefully, well, probably, there's a fair bit of dust here um, coming off the flea. Some of that is just loose little bits of wool, um, but a lot of it is actually scurf, which is basically sheep dandruff. And while this is, is clean fleece, it has been scoured, um, so it's easier to work with. Um, there are these bits and it's, you know, one of the things about working with something that's come from an animal. Same as if you're working with linen, you'll still have little bits of the bark from the outside of the fibres. Um, this one is particularly scurfy. Um, I just make sure that I give a good clean after I've finished working with it for the day. The, doing this before I start spinning is a really nice way to sort of get familiar with the fleece. Of course I've spun up five skeins now, so that's about uh, 600, 700 grams. So I am fairly familiar with the fleece already, but doing this uh, the first time round means that I have a good idea once I start spinning of how it's going to spin up, how the fibres move against each other, um, whether I'm going to have lots of bits that will need to be drafted more carefully, because obviously this isn't an even preparation. Um, I'm leaving lots of bits of texture in here, so there are still areas where, like you can see there, there's a darker little clump of fleece, and some bits don't draft so easily, that, that bit there, that's a more dense bit of fleece that hasn't quite been broken up properly by the carder. And that's quite deliberate because those bits will add the lovely tweedy flex um, to the finished yarn. So you can see here, it's more obvious actually with the white bits where you have these areas where you've got contrast and you get these nice slubby bits. And that character is what I love including in my yarn. Like I am perfectly capable of spinning a very fine yarn from fleece. In fact, I'll quickly show you one um, because this is gorgeous. This is one I spun up um, over a year ago. And so this was prepared a lot more carefully. This was carded multiple times. Um, it was picked in a lot more detail. I took out any coarse, lumpy, matted bits. Um, and as a result, and this is a true woolen spun yarn, so it has a lot more bounce to it. As a result, there's a lot more of an even yarn. Um, this fleece is a blue faced Leicester crossed with a Shetland Romney, um, which is absolutely gorgeous. And this is ridiculously soft and fuzzy. Um, and so that was spun from the fleece with a lot more diligence when preparing it. Um, and so while that is nice, and it, it is a beautiful yarn, 
I don't enjoy the process nearly as much. Um, and I, I just really enjoy, once you have the knitted fabric, I enjoy leaving those elements of the original fleece in there. So you can see that this wasn't just a single colour fleece, there was a colour blend, there were different areas of texture. Um, and that tweediness and character I think is absolutely lovely. Um, I have a jumper which, if you've watched the podcast uh, regularly, you might have seen before, um, which is spun from the same fleece actually as that one I just showed you, um, blended with alpaca. Um, but with that one I did leave, I didn't blend it perfectly and I left a lot of the fibre to its own devices really, so I let it be spun how it wanted to be spun and as a result it's got this amazing bark-like texture where you have the different areas of colour coming out, um, which is just something I really enjoy. So these are my little nests, I've got four from that one, sometimes you know I'll have, I like not to make them too big because um, again I, as I mentioned when I was carding, I like to alternate quite a lot you know I'll these four are from one bat but I have a box here of ones I prepared earlier these will get thrown in here and they'll all get jumbled up so that as I take each one you can see this one has quite a bit of white in it um, so some are more uniform some have this one has a fair bit of brown in it um, and it means that as I alternate them you incorporate all of those characteristics and you don't end up with too much of one thing in one place. So I will now show you how I spin those up. I have my wheel set up here um, and I'm going to start spinning from these little nests that I've prepared and I'll show you how I do this. So I've got my leader here. And I'm just drafting it out. Not aiming for a completely consistent spin so I'm letting some areas of texture come through because that's what we want in this yarn. A nice lumpy bit there. Um, and so because I've already drafted out, oops, broke that, drafted that area a little bit thin, um, because I've already drafted out the fibre I can spin fairly quickly because I don't need to spend a lot of time at this stage drafting. And so I'm mostly just getting, using the drafting to get the yarn to the single to the correct thickness. The wheel I'm using is an Ashford traditional. It's one that I got at least third hand um, a good while ago and it's a little bit clunky these days but it serves me well. I've got a jumbo flyer uh, with a jumbo bobbin on here uh, which allows me to do bigger quantities of yarn which especially for projects like this is very useful because having to do it, it allows me to do much bigger skeins and means I can settle down and spin for longer before I need to ply and then wind off uh, which is very useful from a work flow point of view So 
those lumpy slubby bits are going to be what create a lot of the beautiful texture in the yarn. I'm spinning with a medium amount of twist. Because a loose twist in a yarn like this would probably pill quite a lot. Um, and especially as it's going to be a coat, it would go bobbly very quickly. Um, so a slightly tighter twist is helpful. But I'm not doing a really tight twist. Uh, because this will allow the fabric to sort of mesh together once it's knitted and soaked. A slightly looser twist means you get less st stitch definition um, and more of a uniform fabric rather than holes between the stitches. They sort of the yarn once it's soaked will fill out more. Move that along a bit on this floor because it's a wooden floor with a carpet here. Um, the wheel does tend to run away from me a bit and before, previously I have resorted to sticking it to the floor with tape so that it doesn't constantly creep further and further away from me until I realise that I'm leaning back and reaching my legs out miles away from me. But this time, I'm just trusting it to behave itself. I'm tempted to put some sort of sticky rubber feet on the bottom of the legs, which would hopefully keep it in place a bit better. But generally, I spin upstairs, uh, which in my wall room, which has carpet, and so it stays put a lot better. I'm almost reaching the end of this first little nest here. I'll join on another one. And then I'll carry on spinning for a while. until this bobbin is not quite full because there is still a fair amount of air trapped in this yarn um, so when I ply it it takes up a bit more space on the bobbin 
So I'll spin until there's a little bit of space left and then I'll wind it off uh, with a ball winder, making sure I keep hold of the centre of the ball. Uh, and then I will ply it back on itself as a two ply. And I'll ply very slightly with more twist than in the single and because I find that works nicely um, for my yarns and that means that once they're soaked they end up being nice and balanced and yeah so once it's all plied up I've got it so that I can generally judge um, how full the bobbin's going to be because it does get to the point where if the bobbin's too full you have to sort of manually force the yarn onto the flat uh, through the orifice and onto the bobbin which is no fun it gets very frustrating um, so this skein will probably be just under 140 grams and then once that's done I'll give it a soak and leave it to dry Is this vegetable dyeing that we are hearing so much about less trouble than chemical dyeing? No, it is more trouble. Is it then quicker? No, it takes much longer. Is it a faster dye? No, a really fast chemical dye cannot be surpassed by any vegetable dye. Is it cheaper? No, the cheap chemical dyes in packets cost only a few pence. Why then should anyone trouble to learn how to use vegetable dye? Because of the beauty of its results. Those who use them claim that no chemical dye has that lustre, that underglow of rich colour, that delicious aromatic smell, that soft light and shadow that gives so much pleasure to the eye. These colours are alive, as all beauty is alive. That is why we would like every craft worker in general, and every weaver and embroiderer in particular, to learn something of vegetable dyeing. That is the introduction to the use of vegetable dyes by Violetta Thurston which is a book I've been using a lot um, as I've been learning about natural dyes. Um, as you can see, it's a very small book. I've, I've talked about it before. Um, it's not at all comprehensive in the information it includes. Um, there are lots of gaps. However, it's been a fantastic starting point for me as I've been learning how to use natural dyes and what native plants to Britain can be used for dyeing and I thought I would just include that because it sort of sums up the spirit of this lichen dye experiment that I have ongoing. Um, so those of you who have been watching the podcast previously, I over the winter collected and I'm still collecting um, quite a lot of lichen. This is all windfallen lichen, so lichen that was growing on trees um, that has fallen off in storms uh, and it's only collected from areas where it grows in abundance so we're not damaging any sort of ecosystems. Um, and in my January episode I began to prepare these two jars of different types of lichen in ammonia. And now they've been steeping for a few months and I reckon that one of them, well, both should be ready to use, and I'm going to use one of them. So this one is prepared from the same kind of dye, uh, same kind of lichen, sorry, as this lichen that I have here. So I'm going to compare two methods. So the standard method that is used frequently for a lot of natural dyes is to boil up the dye stuff in a pan and then add in your fiber um, this method is slightly different, so over the period of a few months the lichen is steeped in an ammonia water solution, so just using household ammonia, um, and it apparently gives different colours, and having never dyed with lichen before, I have no idea how this is going to turn out, but I'm going to give it a go, 
and see how these compare. So to start with, I'll open these up. I've got the windows open because this does stink. The ammonia is really quite powerful. Um, and so this one here is the same as this lichen here. So I do sort the lichen quite broadly into different types. So here, it's, if I do a little scribble on here, it's a sort of brown colour, um, quite a yellowy brown. And it's, I think I have a little more of the lichen in this jar than I have in this pile because it gets crushed up and so takes up a lot less space. And then this one, I believe, is oak moss, which is giving a really lovely colour. Um, it's this deep sort of ready orange. If I do this here. It's less of a dark colour, but there's more vibrancy to it. So this one, I'm going to set aside because I sort of have higher hopes for it, and so I want to play with the one that looks a little less exciting first to hopefully iron out any problems in my process so that it's more likely to go better with the one I'm more interested in. Um, and we'll see how that goes for better or worse. So I'm going to put these aside for now because I'll be playing with those later once this first batch is done. So here I have a pan. Uh, this is one of my natural dye pans. Obviously I don't use this for cooking because it gets some fairly nasty stuff in it. Um, and I'm usually, for natural dyes, you would want to strain the, um, the dye stock through often a colander with cheesecloth in it, um, just to get out any pieces of loose matter. However, I'm going to leave them in here because I'm doing a very small amount and any that is left um, on the wool I'll be able to pick off quite easily. On a larger scale often it makes sense to strain it because it's not sensible timing wise to sit there and pick out bits of lichen or bark or leaf or whatever it is. Um, so this, I've got a jug here of, this is water with some cream of tartar dissolved in it. Um, so I'll just put, pour some of that in there. Um, the cream of tartar apparently brightens the colours and lichens are substantive dyes so the yarn shouldn't need mordanting before dyeing. And then I have my yarn here. I've already um, scoured and wet this, so I'm going to ease that into there. Oh, that's already giving quite a deep brown on there. This could end up being very interesting. And I'm working with so this is 40 grams of yarn and I think the amount of lichen that went into this jar was a little more than that. So slightly more weight of lichen to weight of fibre. Um, and you can see, I don't know if you can see that colour there. But I'm going to go and put this on to heat. I'm not going to agitate that any further so I don't 
mess with the wool. I'm going to put that on to heat and we will see how that goes. Now while that first skein is on the heat I'll probably leave that for about an hour simmering away and then I will turn the heat off and leave it to cool, see what the colour's looking like at that stage and then me maybe leave it a little longer. Um, a lo I, I often make my plans sort of as they go along by seeing what sort of colours are coming out. Um, if the colours aren't looking good I leave it a bit longer and it can take up to a week before I give up on something entirely so we'll see how that goes but at the moment it's looking like it's going to be a really lovely brown. So now I'm going to be doing the second skein which is just with the lichen um, straight in with the yarn. Um, I'm going to crush it up a little as I go um, and in with this lichen we've got there are some bits of moss, there are some bits of bark, lots of bits of the whatever the lichen was growing on before it fell. Um, I'm going to not worry about those, um, you know, I'm dying with plants and I'm just going to let them be part of it. I can't imagine there's anything in there that would adversely affect the colour. Um, And so apparently the method, usually this would be done on a much larger scale. Um, so lichen dyeing is used, um, well, in the UK, it's often used up in Scotland and the Shetland Islands and the Orkney Islands, um, where they have a lot of lichen growing on rocks and they are used for the traditional colors in the tartans um, and the method they use apparently is to sort of layer it up so you have a layer of lichen and then a layer of wool. Um, now obviously I don't have a huge amount of either here because this is just an experimental batch so we're going to sort of give, try and replicate that on a small scale if I do that and make a layer of the yarn there. This yarn I'm using is my Mend It 4 ply. Um, so it's my wool from a local farm. It is pure Shetland, uh, no it's not pure Shetland, it's lamb's wool. So it is, um, this wool is from Shetland crosses. So a lot will be Shetlands, there will be quite a lot of Shetland crossed with Romneys and possibly some Shetland blue faced Leicester in there as well. Um, with the lambs, because you get a lot less wool off them when they're shorn, um, we, on the farm, it tends not to be separated out by breed, whereas fleeces uh, for uh, of the ewes and rams um, will be separated out by breed and so there is a lot of pure Shetland yarn but then also a lot of yarn that is a mix of the breeds they have on the farm but the majority of Shetland crosses if not pure Shetlands And I find there's something really soothing about this crumbling of the lichen. I'm sure I could just put it in whole, but to my mind, crumbling it up increases the surface area. Um, and so the smaller the pieces you use, the more the water can get at it to begin to extract the colour. The wool, as um, with the other, is not mordanted, but I have scoured it, so it's slightly damp. 
um, it has been thoroughly wetted and then squeezed out. Oh, lost a bit. And again, I will be picking lots of bits of lichen out of this yarn once it's done. But that's fine. The whole thing is about slow processes. I like natural dyeing sort of because it's special rather than trying to bash out large quantities. And so I feel like the work that goes into it adds value in itself. Oh, there's some proper wood in there. Let's just take out those bits. And any bits that get taken out just go straight into the compost. That's just a lump of bark. And make sure I get some bits down the sides. Oh, you messy skin, you behave yourself. So that's that layer, and so I'll do this layer, and then I'll do another layer on top of the last layer of yarn. One thing I'm also doing um, from sorting the lichens I often just spread them out on a large piece of paper like this and then sort them into piles of usually by form so this lichen is crustos I believe no I'm getting it wrong I'm going to put it in the notes um, so it's, it's this sort of more leafy type. Um, I think a lot of it is Palmetrema palatum, but there are definitely different types in here. Um, I'm generally sorting them by the form rather than specific species because there isn't really enough to sort everything by different types. Like this, this one is definitely different to this one. How can I show you that one? It's just, yeah. So I think this one is Palmetrema palatum. It's got the black underside and you can get really huge pieces of it falling down. Um, but yes, so when I separate it out, I end up with a lot of sort of lichen and bark dust left on the paper and small pieces of lichen that aren't really worth sorting out. A bit of oak moss in there. Um, and I could just throw those in the compost, but what I'm doing is I'm just keeping a running pot of them. And once I've got a fair bit from a few batches of sorting, I'm going to try and use that to dye just to see what happens. Um, I'd say probably only about half of it is actually lichen and the rest is just, you know, forest floor bits of dust and wood and moss that have all just broken down quite small. Um, 
I think it would be interesting to just try out a forest floor die and I wouldn't expect it to be enormously successful <laughs> and I would do it on a small scale just to see what it's like because it's quite interesting there must be some colour in there um, getting there Last layer of wool. Try and keep those strands straight. And we'll crush up the last layer on there. That's just got a full-on piece of twig in there. So a lot of this lichen has come from Savanac Forest, which is in Wiltshire, near where my aunt lives. And I began collecting lichen there over Christmas when I was visiting and she noticed what I was doing and so each time she takes the dogs for a walk there she collects some for me and every so often when I see her if she comes here or if I go there or even if my husband goes to visit and I don't go we'll come back with a box of lichen from her and they're quite small boxes but it's it's lovely it's just wonderful to have that as you know something she does while she's on dog walks and I don't have a dog so I don't get out to walk amongst the trees as frequently as I'd like and also we don't have so much ancient woodland um, just around here um, so there isn't as much of the exciting lichens um, and again it's all windfallen, just gathered from the floor as you walk along. Um, I have some lichen sticks, which are just fallen branches with lichen growing on them. I haven't peeled the lichen off them because there's a chance it's still growing, but once it begins to feel dry and sort of crusty, then I'll know that it's not growing anymore and I'll take it off. But in the meantime, I've just got a box of pretty sticks, which I enjoy. Um, eventually they'll probably be used for dye, but in the meantime they're nice to look at. And I've been talking to Katie, uh, Katie Green of the Green Bean Zine and the Green Bean Podcast. Um, we've been messaging each other and other people have begun joining in using the hashtag lichenfancier on Instagram and we use it for particularly pretty bits of lichen that we find out and about and so if you are remotely interested in all the lichen weirdness then you're more than welcome to join in righty ho that'll go in my weird forest floor box. Um, oh, a bit hiding there. Ready ho. Press that down a little bit. So what I'm going to do is pour the water just so that it covers the wool and the lichen. And again, this is water with some cream of tartar in it, 
which will hopefully do something positive for the colour. Okay. There's still space for plenty of water there, so I'm going to add a little bit more and put that on the heat along with the other. And we will see how that goes. So I've now washed and dried off the skeins that I've dyed with the lichen. So first up is the one dyed with the lichen that was steeping in ammonia. And that is this one here. So you can see it's a lovely sort of light, slightly yellowy brown. Um, it's definitely a neutral. Um, it's quite a pleasant colour. I would say that given the amount of time that's gone into the preparing the dye and everything, it's probably not worth it. Like, it's a very pleasant colour, and I'm pleased that it has given a colour. Um, but, yeah. The other one, however, with, that was just put directly in the pot, is this one. And I'm super pleased with this one. It's gorgeous. It's a sort of golden, orangey yellow. Um, and it's just so pretty. I, I really, really enjoy this colour. People who know me or have been following me for a while know that I love oranges, and so that is perfect. So together, these two are really quite lovely. Um, I'm really quite pleased with how they've turned out, considering I was worried that they weren't going to give any colour at all. Uh, so that's very hopeful for my future experimentations with lichen. And I am quite aware that this is already a very long episode, so I'm going to call it a day there until next time, which will be in a few weeks. Um, in the meantime, if you want to keep up with what I'm up to, you can go on my website and subscribe to the newsletter, that's on marinaskewer.com, and I'm on Instagram, Ravelry, Facebook as Marina Skewer. Um, and if you want to support the content I'm creating on the podcast here, uh, I do have a Ko-fi link um, where you can just chuck me a couple of quid to help me keep going which would be much appreciated and so until next time bye bye mm -hmm.